Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Open Mind Circle Elite Executive Roundtable, Hillside's CARES case study, service expansion, health plan contracting, and strategic repositioning for California's evolving value-based market. I'm Stacy Fox with the Open Minds Market Intelligence Team, and I'd like to introduce Garrett Zabel and Lucy Garcia of Hillside's Cares of South Pasadena, California. Garrett is Director of Business Development and is responsible for developing opportunities that benefit the organization's mission, market positioning, and financial sustainability. He has oversight of public grant solicitations, commercial payer marketing and contracting, strategic partnerships, service line development, targeted referral outreach, policy reform measures, and multi-sector health initiatives. Prior to joining Hillsides, Garrett worked for a social enterprise in rural Northwest Vietnam and the University of Sydney Business School. Lucy Garcia is the business development analyst overseeing health plan contracting and relationship management process for multiple service lines, including residential and intensive outpatient programs. She supports the business office with responsibilities related to referral development, patient experience, and marketing for commercial programs. Additionally, she leads market research efforts to identify new service lines for strategic positioning and growth at Hillsides. She's experienced in working with the nonprofit, public, and private sector in the healthcare field. Today's session is moderated by Richard Lewis, Open Minds Vice President, Western Region. He brings extensive experience as a behavioral healthcare administrator, business development specialist, and innovator of new service lines for behavioral healthcare organizations. His expertise in population health management program development, strategic planning, and payer mixed diversification help create programs that target high cost and complex behavioral health populations. Before we get started, a few housekeeping reminders. Your audio will be muted to, during today's briefing. However, we encourage you to submit questions that you may have using the system's question box, and we will present them to our speakers at the end. The slides and recording from today's briefing will be available on the Open Minds website tomorrow. Richard, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacy. Well, welcome everybody to this, to this morning's webinar. Um, please just punch to be here. This is our first uh, uh, our first California, uh, uh, our first presentation for our California webinar series that we're starting today. Every quarter we'll be featuring a, a provider, a, a payer, maybe a county, a county mental health system that is innovating um, and kind of trailblazing in our changing uh, marketplace here in California, a lot because of CalAIM. Um, and I'd like to make a few uh, comments and then turn things over to our case study, which I think you'll find very interesting. Um, in the last, in the last, you know, 30 years that I've been in behavioral healthcare, um, there have been a lot of very big, um, you know, evolutions of our health of our system. In the 80s, we found ourselves with uh, commercial health plans and um, uh, no managed care. At that time, I was in psychiatric hospitals and you know enjoyed the days of enjoyed the days of, of, of uh, you know 30 day length of stays, twelve hundred dollar uh, day rates, um, treating patients in hospitals that really in today's in today's world would be considered really mild to moderate. Um, uh, shift ten years to to the 90s, and we find ourselves with managed care here in California and uh, taking a hold. And I think it really affected more what we did on the inpatient side uh, than in some of the other, uh, and in primary care, than in our, our other uh, outpatient behavioral health um, service delivery systems. As a young uh, chief operating officer of a psychiatric hospital, I found myself uh, with a hospital that was half full because of managed care and had to, and had to really try to figure out how to bring in a new treatment population, a new revenue source, um, how to take advantage of the services and capabilities that we had at that time, you know, inpatient, uh, you know, day treatment, uh, mobile crisis response teams, and those types of things, and, 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 and did the first, um, first county contract for Side Cospel in LA County, where we were now taking indigent adults and adolescents, as well as uh, Medi-Cal populations. Uh, talk about a paradigm shift 
for our, our, our clinicians and our staff, you know, big culture change, but really needing to innovate in the market, in the changing market that we found ourselves in the 90s under managed care. Um, I think the next big thing that we saw here in California um, was the move towards um, probably around in the, in the, in the you know, 20, 23, 20, uh, 2014, 15, kind of in that area, right after ACA was launched, is the, um, is the awareness by health plans in California that they need to start to partner with behavioral health care providers that were, that were good at managing and treating complex populations. Um, at that time, um, start, started working with Kaiser and piloting, you know, what we would call a full service partnership or an ACT program uh, here in California with our county contracts, you know, took that, re reconfigured it to something that they could pay for that provided intensive case management and population health coordination um, to reduce, you know, in that, in those days, it was really about reducing psychiatric hospital readmissions, but really about the first time we were seeing uh, health plans come to community-based providers and try to take advantage of the expertise and capacity that we had to be able to um, help them reduce costs for, for complex folks and, um, you know, move the needle up to today. And, and here we are in, you know, you know 2021, 22, and we're in the midst of Cal AIM in California. Managed care is here. Um, the CalAIM initiative is moving us we're towards more um, health plan contracting, um, more um, integration of community-based services with what uh, health plans will be paying for as they start to move more into um, serving you know, SMI adults and SED kids. Um, we just saw a few months ago in January 1, the, the first managed care uh, health plan contracts for uh, uh, enhanced case management and in lieu of services, um, really bringing us full, full, you know, fully forward into an environment where um, uh, where the payers are looking for providers for solutions, as they were back in the 90s. Um, for those of you who are contracting with the with the health plans for ECM and ILOS, um, um, I think some of us are surprised that the health plans don't have a, a they don't have a, a, a program description for these things. If they're really relying on us as providers to coming up with the solutions, the staffing models, the program approach, and and how to structure these in in a in a in a, in a cost based in a um, cost effective way um, that makes it worth it for the provider, but also addresses the um, the ultimate goals of of these of the health plans. So um, with that, I, I want to turn things over to to our case study which really has been on, on, on a similar journey for the past few years and want to learn from, from their experience about um, um, how they've navigated and viewed the changes here in California and where they're at today. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Garrett Zabel. Thanks, Richard. Uh, pleasure to be here. Good morning or good afternoon. I guess it depends on where you're joining us from. Um, Today, uh, the purpose of today's talk, as, as Richard mentioned um, in the first segment, the majority of the presentation, we're going to go through a case study about one our residential program and how we incorporated commercial funding into that program and really transformed that program for the commercial payer. And then after we do a deep dive on that, we're going to move into some strategic partnerships that we've built with health plans, as Richard mentioned, as we look at moving more and more into that space. So first, a little bit about ourselves, um, our organization. We are a multi-service nonprofit agency called Hillsides. Our operating budget is about 50 million a year. That's considered medium size in LA. We have five core programs, the majority of which are community-based mental health um, and child welfare. Um, you can see here the variety of services that we offer. We have clinics throughout the county, but our flagship program really is our residential campus in Pasadena. It's a beautiful 17-acre campus. We've had it for 109 years. We started, started as an orphanage and has since evolved and became a group home and then more recently an STRTP program. And up until recently has served as a campus for children, um, for foster children. And because of some federal legislation, we're gonna get into that today, we've since downsized that program and have been transforming it towards the commercial payer. So that'll be the focus of today's talk is looking at how we did that and the process we went through. So first, I guess, the question to ask is why? 
Um, you know, as an organization, we are 95% publicly funded. And for the other nonprofit executives on the phone or on this call, I think if that keeps you up at night, you're in the right place. We're going to talk about that. Um, so the first rationale, strategically thinking high level, is to diversify our revenue. Um, luckily, our VP at the time and our now CEO, Stacey Roth, had the foresight to realize that that isn't sustainable for us as an organization. And back in 2018, she really set out to move into commercial funding, to move towards more health plan contracting in an effort to diversify our revenue sources and also mitigate against risk of having all our eggs in that county funding basket. The other thing, and as Richard mentioned, is moving more towards um, the future. As we see, you know, with CalAIM, whether it be the commercial lives or through the public beneficiaries on the Medicaid side, is an increased movement of the administration of healthcare and behavioral health services moving towards managed care. We're seeing that with CalAIM, with whole person care, um, with the ECM and community supports, as everything's moving less from this carve out county agency model to the managed care side. We wanna prepare for that shift so that it doesn't happen to us. Another reason is exploring uh, margin opportunities. So can we secure new revenue streams for existing service? Are there better rates? Moving away from the system of a single county payer towards multiple payers that have different rates and being able to negotiate and strategize, that was really attractive to us and something we've really taken advantage of. In addition to that is the value-based reimbursement or alternative payment models. Um, we're always interested in looking at that too and moving towards more risk sharing to see if there's an opportunity for us to leverage profit margins on that side as well. And then beyond that, and I think what's interesting and for some of the other folks on the call you may identify with this is what we've seen is that many of our services that we're doing that we're already good at, some of the care coordination, the wraparound services, are in fact turning out to be marketable on the commercial side. So is there a way to leverage our expertise that we built through county funding and repackage that and sell that to new payer on the commercial side? Or is there an opportunity to pitch those services to the commercial payers? And maybe they're less familiar with that, but that is something that would be of interest to them for their commercial lives. Okay, so we're gonna go really high level first and then do a deep dive onto each of these. As I mentioned in 2018, we got a contract with Kaiser Permanente for, uh, to serve children and adolescents in our residential program. At the time, it was an STRTP geared really towards child welfare. Average length of stay was you know, anywhere from six to 18 months. And we started seeing those clients. And that was, I think, the genesis of the commercial programming on our campus. And we realized there might be an opportunity for us here to really expand that, not only to additional payers, but the levels of service that we're offering on that campus. So we did what uh, any smart organization does, and we called Richard and said, hey, um, what do, where do we start? Like, how do, how do we get into this? And we did a uh, consulting engagement with Open Minds, and they did analysis in the market, showed us who the payers were, who our competitors were, who our referral sources were, and it really set the stage, I think, to start to get ready for that sort of work at Hillsides. And what we found is that there was a significant amount of shifting that had to be done internally to prepare for that. And it wasn't really developing new things as much as it was of shifting existing competencies that we had. So as an example, our marketing was really geared towards donors. It was all donor facing. We didn't have to compete for clients on the public side, but we were moving into this market of consumer choice and people getting online and shopping for services. So how do we shift our marketing towards this new segment of consumer choice and online reviews? Um, similarly, business development. You know, How do we create internal positions that are just tasked with managing relationships with these commercial payers that are thinking strategically about how do we go after these contracts? Do we go in or stay out of network? Our clinical model, you know, we were moving from this model of a long length of stay, six to six, you know, six months to 18 months to a short-term acute stabilization residential model with treatment happening at lower levels of intensive outpatient. So there were some significant changes that happened at the clinical level too. So really, I think there was a lot of internal prep work we had to do, and some of that we built in tandem as we started contracting and continues to happen now. Um, but we had to think about that as an organization of what sort of shifts did we have to make to really move from this county funded model into like a competitive commercial environment. Um, similarly, with the contracting, there was a tremendous amount of strategy that went there into that. Um, and we had such a good experience with Open Minds the first time we called them again and said, you know, how do we do this? Um, and they helped us developing a pitch deck, um, figuring out what targeted referral outreach looked like, 
how to market ourselves to EAPs and all the different nuances that's involved in getting business in a commercial market. And then finally, if you could imagine imaginary line between contracting and growth, I think that's like the building of the ship. And then there's the growth. Once you have your contracts established, your programs running, how do you really become the preferred provider in your market? How do you maximize referral volume? Um, how do you launch new programs with those relationships you develop with commercial payers? How do you reach out to them and say, what can I build that you need? And is, do we have the capacity internally to launch that? So we'll go into a little bit of that in a bit here. Next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, for today's talk, we're gonna talk about Hillsides Cares. That is the brand and name for our residential continuum of care um, for our commercially funded programs on our residential campus. So this is our continuum, as I mentioned. Um, you know, we started with residential. It was important for us from the beginning to really be able to offer, to be competitive um, from a business standpoint and be able to offer the full continuum. Um, that certainly gave us an advantage with rate negotiations and contracting. But beyond that, clinically, it allowed us to offer the full breadth of services that a client or family might need. So starting at the top, residential treatment, which is more of an acute stabilization in the commercial market, typically a month of stay, a month length of stay or less. Um, and then once that's complete, the uh, child can step down into our partial hospitalization program, which is basically day treatment, five days a week. The next level of care, which can be a direct admit or a step down, is our intensive outpatient program. And that's a three hour a day, three day a week uh, day treatment model. And the idea is that a client can either directly admit to any of these levels of care or they can step down as they start to integrate back into the community and recover um, from the uh, presentation of their symptoms or the mental illness that they're suffering from. And then beyond that, we have a, a suite of aftercare services um, and coordinated care that we've built as well, um, which I'll get to on the next slide. So with each of those levels of care, what we did um, was we included follow-up sessions post-discharge. And part of that was with the commercial um, preferences of collecting HEDIS measures, uh, really marketing ourselves as a diversion program and keeping kids out of acute settings, out of inpatient stays, out of the emergency department. Access to data is really challenging, as many of you know. So one of the ideas we had was, could we offer the follow-up session to not only ensure that the client is adhering to the treatment recommendations, but to also collect data on, did you go back to the hospital? Did you have to access the emergency department again? Did, you, did your child go back into an inpatient setting? And using some of that data from a marketing perspective to go out, go out and show it to the health plans and like, look at the model is working. Um, or similarly, are there areas we can improve on? Are there certain populations that maybe are struggling and, and things that we can beef up clinically? Another thing, and those of you who are on the public um, county funded side may be familiar with this uh, service that we offer to commercial on the commercial side is our intensive in-home behavioral health services or IIHBHS. I love the acronym. <laughs> um, we, that is wraparound. Uh, that's a wraparound program. We got a contract for Kaiser with Kaiser for wraparound in 2018. Uh, it's, a, it's a case rate. So there is some, I guess, up and downside risk. It's an, um, some value-based payment model that we've uh, worked out with them and we've gone off and marketed that to other health plans as well. And then beyond that, our traditional outpatient mental health therapy, we can use that as a direct, directly admitted service. So we have, we work with um, EAPs and employer groups who send their employees to our therapists and they see them that way. We can also use that as a step down, as a client who's in our residential continuum of care, as they transition back into the community, we can pair them with one of our commercially funded traditional outpatient mental health therapists to ensure the continuity of care after they leave our facility-based services. Is so Gary, really, I think, wait, go I'm ahead. Sorry. No, no, go, go I would have made a comment. Okay. Oh, well, no, I'll go back. I thought you were doing with it, with the, I jumped on you. I, I think what, what you, you know, one of the things that, that I really like about the way you put together the aftercare services uh, with these particular items here is that it really demonstrates to the payers that um, there is a movement of a client from, you know, a more costly level of care like residential treatment to these in-community type uh, programs and services and follow-up that are really designed to keep clients in lower levels of care, in outpatient treatment. Um, there's, a, there's a case management component to it so that we can continue to keep folks for long periods of time, hopefully forever, 
you know, in these outpatient settings, you know, engage with family, back in school. Um, I mean, these are the kinds of things where, where the pairs really uh, are putting a lot of emphasis these days, are, you know, the ability to stabilize um, from an acute episode, like you do in residential, and then ultimately being able to transition folks into some kind of a long-term, you know, client court, you know, care coordination kind of a kind of a system. And I, I think that looks great. Yeah, thanks for that, Richard. And I might also add that, you know, when we did our first round of contracting back in 2018-19, we only had residential mental health. And it was interesting to compare that experience with contracting again in this past year and having a complete continuum built out and the response that we got from the health plans and their ability to come up in their rates and their interest in meeting with us to do a virtual presentation. It was a completely different response because what we found is that offering that continuum, that entire continuum under one roof was really unique for our industry. Either people were highly specialized in substance use and didn't do mental health or was fragmented. They started a residential facility in one area of the county and then have to go to PHP in another county. They'd need IOP, but that facility didn't offer it or only for substance use. For, so for us to be able to offer the entire continuum from the most restrictive to the least restrictive clinical interventions under one roof and ensure that care coordination as a child and family cascade down through services was really a competitive advantage for our organization. And something you didn't mention that I think is worth mentioning is that part of the part of the positioning marketing strategy for this new your new continuum was to say to payers that instead of sending clients to, that have high psych hospital readmission rates, let's say, to a psychiatric hospital, bring them here for stabilization. Yes. We'll stabilize, we'll use wraparound, we'll use all the things that we provide. And unlike a psychiatric hospital that'll keep a client for seven to 10 days and discharge to, to not much, um, you have a continuum that's gonna take them and the family all the way down to a program that's your aftercare services that are gonna maintain a client in the community and with the goal of reducing psychiatric hospital remission. I think that's a huge, huge um, sales, uh, a great sales uh, pitch for the payers. Yeah, and that's exactly right. I think those of us that were sort of raised in the public funding environment as well as we're used to that level of acuity as well and being able to serve the highly specialized, high need, high acuity clients. You know, I know recently we had a client, a residential facility was coming to us um, with 38 inpatient placements in the last two years. Um, and we were the first successful placement for her. And she's currently in the process of stepping down to her IHS, IIHVHS program. Um, and it was interesting. We have a captive audience from Edna, you know, with care coordinators have been following this family for a couple of years and saying, wow, what happened here? Like, this is amazing that it's actually working with this facility. So um, I think that specialty and expertise was really, you know, it comes from the STRTP environment and serving specialty mental health clients on the county side. No, and, 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 and again, the other things, you know, in working with the plans, uh, all the evidence-based practice you bring, trauma-informed you know, care, um, 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 unlocked, unlocked in settings, seclusion right. restraint, re, uh, you know, non-use of seclusion restraint for crisis episodes. I mean, these are the things that we want that we're peers are, are moving towards, and 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 that families and, and clients really would rather be in these settings than you know the traditional settings that we're used to. So uh, I, I, it's all great. Okay, Lucy. Yeah, thanks. I, this is a good transition actually into the marketing <laughs> um, side of things. But as Garrett said, we had to repurpose a lot of our programs for the commercial space. And likewise, we had to do the same with our, with our marketing practices. We couldn't keep them the same as they were as now in this commercial space. We were competing for clients really for the first time uh, since the inception of the agency. So we started by doing a market analysis and really identifying two segments that we wanted to acquire business from. And these were commercial payers and commercial customers. So as Garrett mentioned, we were operating in the child welfare model before this, and we were being sent involuntary referrals for DCFS. So this was really something that wasn't on our radar at all. Um, but now that consumers and clients have choice, in this really saturated market in California, we knew that we really needed to improve our marketing strategies and utilize both push and pull marketing to start to acquire business. 
So we first started to lay out what our unique goals were and what we wanted, wanted to achieve for each of these two segments. Uh, so for example, for our business to business marketing with payers, we work to establish contracts at agreeable rates to become a preferred provider. And because of this, we really geared our marketing materials towards you know, becoming a part of their network. As Richard said, we'd be a cost reduction strategy for them and really communicated that with payers in that segment. For the business to consumer marketing, it's a completely different marketing strategy that we had to initiate, which was really communicating towards commercial customers, such as referral sources and families that our facility, that our programs were the best. We could provide the top quality care and be a real partner in care for, for their kids, you know, being sent to our programs. So this was a huge shift for us as an agency. And we knew, especially in the beginning, that we needed to really focus on both of these segments to, to be strategic about, um, you know, acquiring new clients and, and customers. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, talk a little bit about branding and online presence. So to prepare to go and market to both of these segments, we understood that the internet would be a big front door to our program. So we started by creating a brand new website for these Hillsides Cares programs that would be specifically tailored for the two marketing segments that I just mentioned in the last slide. Uh, we wanted to focus this website on their needs, their wants, and have a really clear call to action that was to contact us and to get more information about our programs, which completely differed, again, from how we operated in the past. We Something unique is this website is completely different from the Hillsides website, and we did this purposefully, as Garrett said, our old website's really geared towards donors, and we wanted to acquire donations, and it talked about the functions of our other five core programs, and this Hillsides, hillsidescares.org website was specifically for the business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer segments. Um, you can see on the screenshot, that's actually our, our landing page, our homepage on the website, um, which again is just very different from our nonprofit website. And I love so, this, and I love this very much. It, it um, when we talk about when, in, for the purposes of the audience, when we talk about uh, working with health plans and working with health plan members and families, um, it really is the website is the portal for all referrals. It's where families go, it's where clients go, it's where case managers go and they need to go to a landing site like this that just you know speaks uh speaks to them in in kind of help plan language um e easy to navigate to find out about programs and services and how to make a referral um, i remember seeing the old hillsides um, website and it to your point like, like many uh community nonprofit providers it really is geared more towards fundraising and foundations mm -hmm. for the community things that we do um, and so this really, I, I love the new brand and and, um, and this the new face that you know clients can engage in and referral sources can can come to. Yeah, and I mean we really prioritized making it consumer friendly, really easy to navigate, and I think that's something that differs from our old website as well. But we did want to keep with the brand. I mean, as you can see, we kept Hillsides in the name Hillsides Cares. I mean, Hillsides is a really reputable, reputable organization that's been around for over 100 years. So we really wanted to tie that in, but make it distinct as well. Um, so that's how we ended up at Hillsides Cares. And it's been really great so far. And we've received a lot of positive feedback. From and one last comment. Again, the fact that it's it, 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 it comes right at you that you're putting yourself out there as a comprehensive mental health system. That's mm -hmm. your full service. You know, you're, you've got a continuum as opposed to just, you know, identifying yourself being in, in a niche market. We're just a residential treatment provider, in, you know, in Pasadena. Exactly. Here we are a full service, uh, a full service system. And, and, right. and I think that's what payers really want to see. And I think that's what clients want to see, all the things that you have to offer. Um, so I, I thought that was very well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so that was a really exciting lift that this website's only been live for a couple months, so it's been really exciting to already receive positive feedback. Um, but just to quickly touch on the other bullets on the slide, 
we also initiated search engine optimization and paid, paid ads, which is really fancy lingo for getting more people to come to our website. But this was brand new for us as, again, not something that needed to be done in our old model of care. Um, we knew that other facilities in the Southern California area were probably working with really large marketing budgets to rank higher on Google searches and get their names out there. So we have started engaging in some of those practices as well, in addition to also branding ourselves and marketing ourselves on other online platforms. So we also created profiles on Google My Business and on Psychology Today, which surprisingly have amounted in many referrals. So it's been great to continue to uh, promote ourselves on there. Um, finally, just to quickly touch on online reviews, I know Garrett already talked about it a bit, but this was not something we were really cognizant of in the old model of care, as again, we were being sent involuntary referrals, people didn't really have choice, but in this commercial space, people are searching for the best in care and want to see what other people have to say about us. So we're being really cognizant about that moving forward. And um, for something as serious as you know the mental health treatment, we know that people are really going to want to be shopping around. So we, um, again, are just being very cognizant of that moving forward. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so building the website was a phenomenal foundation to our marketing, but it, we quickly learned that it was not enough. <laughs> Creating the website was not just going to have referrals start streaming into us. Uh, so because of this, we, we devised a referral development plan to promote our business, stay relevant, and start to develop relationships. So we first initiated a targeted referral outreach plan for commercial consumers to promote ourselves as a new provider in this commercial space. We created tailored messaging for the business to business and business to consumer segments based on our intended goals and outcomes and really sent them targeted messaging um, you know, per marketing segment. In tandem with this, we developed an education campaign where we sent specific collateral to each marketing segment. And this collateral includes examples like electronic brochures, printed collateral, slide decks, really depending on the audience and gearing it towards what they could get out of our program. Another tactic was um, creating and maintaining strong relationships, as relationships are really the key to any business, but especially this service service line. And it, in my role as a business development analyst, I really um, have pioneered this um, with Hillside's Cares. And I reached out and cold called, cold emailed uh, different individuals to offer, you know, informational webinars, phone calls, Zoom sessions, really just to start to open up these referral pathways and make it a collaborative conversation as to what we could do to, um, you know, best help them as an organization as well. Um, and just touching briefly on the direct referral pathways, something also brand new that we had to do as an agency was create a dedicated phone line for commercial intakes. So we created a, a phone line completely separate from Hillsides. We hired new staff and created a new commercial intake team as well, just to really streamline the process and eliminate barriers. We didn't want people calling in and, you know, someone on the end of the line talking about donations and stuff from other aspects of Hillside. So this dedicated line, we also found to be really helpful um, in bringing up Hillside's cares. You can ask, building your referral development, um, uh, your, your, build, your referral development platform, if you will, um, mm -hmm. this is something that we didn't do overnight. It's something that you've no. taken some time to build, I would imagine, a year, two years, I mean, my, my, minus the COVID pause, but I know. <laughs> um, this is something that you've incrementally been, been investing in and growing. Exactly, um, and it's been primarily virtual due to the, the nature of COVID, but we're hoping to continue to build upon relationships and meet people in person, bring them to our campus, um, but again, it's a slow and steady process. Yeah, yeah. Now, Richard, you bring, you bring up a good point. It's a large industry, but it's insular, and, and we're not known yeah. just quite yet as a mental health treatment provider for commercially insured members. And there's, you know, you could say residential treatment, mental health, and a couple providers come up 
come to mind in the LA County area. We want to become that provider. So how do we, as quickly as possible, get our name out there, become, uh, have a presence in the community and online? And um, I think Lucy did a great job of outlining some of the, the ways to do that. It's really just getting out there, pounding the pavement, marketing yourselves heavily online, building relationships, making sure clients we can't see that we do a warm handoff so that we get credit for that referral and, the, and that facility will want to send us clients back. So um, it it's, goes beyond just our department as well, but working with our intake department, working with our clinical staff um, to really create this, just this presence of, of wanting to build partnerships and relationships in the community. No, and it, and, it, and, it, and it surely does demonstrate to the payers that you're developing relationships with that you have an easy way to make referrals. Exactly. Uh, they know you because of the marketing tactics, the marketing activities that you're doing. And, and, and it's becoming more and more important here in California as we start to compete with other providers that we've never had to compete with before, um, especially as we're, you know, the competition will be starting for, ILOS and, and enhanced case management contracts. You know, everybody's going to get a contract who wants one, but after a while, the referrals are going to go to those providers that have these types of systems in place that can deliver the service, you know, that's cost effective and that has the ease of, of, of access and, 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 and service. So I, I think it's really, really um, it's worth the time to build what you've built. Yeah, exactly. And we're only going to continue to to expand upon it from here. This is just the the foundation. But expanding upon that, we pulled some data actually from our call center and from our referrals to just show how much it truly has grown since the inception of the program. So our program and our call center launched in December 2021. So not that long ago. Uh, and you can see that in the first month of December, we only had three referrals, uh, which is pretty low. But again, we've just started to ramp up our efforts. Um, and now in March of 2022, we're already tracking to reach 45 referrals by the end of the month. And this just really has been positive for us to see that our referral outreach efforts have been so positive and are amounting to, to growth. And um, you know, as we continue the, the outreach and we continue to ramp up the SEO and the PPC marketing, we anticipate it's only going to continue to grow from here. But um, it's been really positive to see what's been going on so far. Looking at the, the graph on the right, we pulled where these referrals are coming from. And something that really stood out to Garrett and I was that only about a third were coming from, you know, health plans themselves with establishing a contract. and being placed on their provider directory. That's not everything that's going to be getting us referrals. It's the relationships, it's the outreach, and that's what we found, that the majority of them are coming from the, our community referral sources and, and online. And it just is a testament to show that what, we, what we're doing is working. And again, I only think it's going to continue to, to grow from here. So finally, with Hillside's Cares, we briefly just wanted to touch on customer experience as Again, in this consumer world, people, sorry, my lights just went dim. <laughs> in this consumer world, um, people are really paying close attention to, to the experience and their programs. And um, as word of mouth is going to become more common, we really want to provide the best quality service for each individual that comes into our program from their intake to discharge into aftercare. And we're setting up ways to capture data on customer experience as well, which again is brand new for us as of pretty much December. So just to go over a couple that we're really excited to, to roll out. Um, first, we, through a market analysis, we really saw what other programs in the industry had, um, what some of their program features were, and we mimicked some of those. So we were able to meet consumer expectations. Examples of this include having family weekend programming. That was something that we did not have before December 2021. Um, initiating those aftercare check-in calls like Garrett mentioned earlier to make sure that the families are linked to services and if we can better support them after they've already left our care. So things like that really helped to, or we shifted to meet the consumer expectations. Another thing that we're doing, as Garrett mentioned as well, was tracking for five key HEDIS-like measures. 
there's so many key measures, but we decided to really keep um, a pulse on five of them to see how we're tracking in the program and use these as ways to improve our program and improve the customer experience and the client experience. Um, ask, and a final, oh, go ahead. Can I ask what those five are? Yeah, so um, dis d discharge, where they go when they discharge, aftercare check-in and recidivism. Um, sorry, I'm kind of blanking on them. Garrett, if you can remember them right now, too. <laughs> I know, I think one might access have been- Access to care. Yeah, access to care. and con cons Wasn't there one related to um, consumer satisfaction? Mm -hmm, consumer satisfaction. Um, yeah, using the- Micro scales and the other surveys that we built. Yeah, I should have had them listed. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but those are the main ones that we really wanted to to track and see how we were doing as an agency. And although they weren't on the top of my mind right now, we did create workflows for our program to to capture this data and to pull reports on. We're in the process right now, actually, of creating a dashboard so we can be continually monitoring these. Um, so again, all of these are kind of in the initiation phase as they're brand new for us as an agency to be tracking, but um, we're excited. Mm -hmm. And ultimately we wanna be showing this information to payers, you know, to show them how we're doing. Um, so that was a big impetus of starting to, to track. Yeah, they would love to see those measures, especially if the, the outcomes, especially if the numbers look good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and exactly. Um, those are the two main ones. Um, if you wanted to, to take it away from here, Garrett, Sure, thank you, Lucy. Um, so as, as I mentioned previously, you know, if the government funded county world it is really, I think, characterized by a single payer, a compliance, um, by com competition on the front end for the contract, and then a, a lot of just adhering um, to regulation and red tape. And, and it's, it's a much different feel from the commercial environment of competing for business when there's multiple payers. Um, so there's a lot with that. I think there's a lot of strategy that goes into contracting. Um, first, you know, knowing what your edge is, um, knowing your advantage in the market. Uh, I mentioned for us, you know, the difference of contracting in 2018 for residential and then doing another pass this year when we, as Lucy mentioned, we launched PHP and IOP and really came at it again and said, look, at, we've got the full portfolio now. Can we increase our rates for residential as we add PHP and IOP and then get more lucrative rates for those services? Um, and offering it as a package. So there was a strategy in that. Some other things we figured out, you know, was there's a lot, a great deal of strategy goes into whether you, or not you go in network. Um, we engaged a third-party billing company who had access to hundreds of thousands of claims and were able to tell us with these specific health plans, it does not make sense to go in network. The volume is low. Um, it's not gonna justify going in network at a lower rate. And when you can just bill out a network or do single case agreements out of network at a much higher rate, the volume is gonna be the same. So there's a lot of, I guess, nuanced strategy that we've kind of learned as, we, we, as we've gone along, but that was unique to the commercial space as well. We don't see that with our county mental health plan. They tell us what to do, they cut our rates and we're kind of beholden to their system. Like this time we have a little choice in the matter too and there's a lot more marketing involved. So it looks a lot different. Another thing, you know, as we talk about these two new customers, the commercial payer and the commercial families, when dealing with a commercial payer, um, something our organization did, which, you know, I think Lucy and I are a standing, living an example of that is, is creating a business development role, somebody who's going to oversee this, somebody who's going to liaison with your marketing team, with your research team, and, um, and meet the needs of these new customers. I think it really takes a dedicated role, or at least somebody who's gonna have a lot of time to focus on this and manage those relationships with the health plans, help quarterback all the efforts and in, that's involved in building these programs and contracting and credentialing. Um, and we saw an organization that's creating a business development team um, was you know, really a, a great step towards moving in that direction. In terms of outreach, you know, we live in a virtual environment now. Um, we, our first engagement with Open Minds, we built a pitch deck um, that we used to reach out to health plans are notoriously really challenged, hard to get in touch with, um, inundated with requests for people to join their networks. And sometimes it takes a lot of persistence. You know, you gotta reach out, they don't reply, you follow up a week later. Um, so having a, something that's digital, that's compelling to grab their attention, to be able to get in front of them and say, look at here's the value we can bring to your network. Really important to be able to do that. 
Um, same thing with our collateral, you know, and that applies to health plans and our commercial families and regularly updating that. What are our outcomes? How are we different from other folks who may have a network? Um, and then as Lucy mentioned, collecting those HEDIS measures. So are we moving the needle in terms of readmissions? Are we doing anything that's unique that we can really leverage um, to go off and ask for rate increases or new contracts? So gathering that data and being able to put it um, in front of these health plans, I think is, you know, also something that's um, a great marketing strategy. And as, uh, you know, Richard and I have said this before, but um, a health plan told me one time, you know, be brief, be brilliant, be gone. And uh, that really, I think, is a, is a good motto to follow is how do you get their attention in a compelling way, but also being mindful of their time. And it's been different, you know, with the help, the different commercial pairs that we work with. Some of them are willing to jump on a call with us and, and listen to a virtual presentation about our programs. Others, it's been completely via email. And we have to follow up every two weeks and say, hey, did you get my last request? And, you know, so it's challenging and it's different. And I think it really takes someone dedicated to be overseeing that. And that also gets to the relationship development piece. I think, you know, we met when we meet with plans, we'll often just ask them, like, what else do you need? What are your high priority areas? And we heard from two separate plans in the past several weeks is adolescent female eating disorder. Um, that's a huge need in our market. It's, it, we don't know where to send these, these children that are suffering from this issue. Um, and so it's, it's something for us as an organization, we can take that and say, is that something we can build on our campus? Can we add that as a specialty programming that might blend with even some of the mental health but have tailored programming for that population? So that's something we're looking at as well. Um, but that we wouldn't have figured that out and known that had we not had those relationships with the health plans and been meeting with them and talking with them and asking them like, what do you need? Um, and then, as I mentioned, persistence, you know, is critical. I think these contracting reps, you know, I was on the phone with a gentleman from Magellan a couple of weeks ago, and he said, I've got dozens of applications for substance use providers. He also happened to tell me, he said, I've only got a handful of providers across the state that serve children, you know, children, mental health services, and you're one of them. So we're really interested in moving forward with you. So being persistent and, and having those relationships to find out what those insights are, gain access to like what the network needs are, um, and how you're going to distinguish yourself in a really competitive environment with a lot of other providers reaching out, bugging them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Richard, did you have anything to add there before we um, transition into partnerships? No, I mean, I, other than just to point out, and, and you, I think you eloquently presented it, is that that relationship is key, having a dedicated person that can really develop those relationships with the payers. And as you know, a payer may have different folks in the organization. You may be working with a network person, a contract person, and there's different folks in there. But just the, the value of having that relationship to do exactly what you were doing, which is we should be, we should have a good enough re a a part, a relationship so that we can get you know rates negotiated on an annual basis and that we're always looking for new opportunities to expand contracts or expand or develop new service lines for payers. You want to be the go-to for yeah. you know what they're looking for. And you know the opportunity to start exploring uh, eating disorders uh members is something that to your point you wouldn't know if you didn't have those relationships so that communication is vital that single point of contact is critical and and and, and just just essential in in you know successful partnerships you, you did a great job thank you okay so we're going to shift gears here i want to invite everyone to kind of just put aside what we just talked about because it's it's really quite a transition and we're, um at Hillsides, we, beyond just our billable services and contracting, we've looked at how do we incorporate partnerships with these health plans, with these commercial pairs, with really with everything that we're doing. You know, I mentioned above, and as, as Richard talked about, Kellen and things moving to the administration of benefits, moving more and more towards managed care entities and that sort of environment. So we've really made a concerted effort as an organization to incorporate health plans in different things that we're doing. So I'm gonna go through a couple case studies really quickly. I apologize, I'm gonna be brief because I could spend an hour talking on each of these, but just different examples of how, as an organization, we've partnered with health plans in a strategic way to develop these sort of um, collaborative relationships. And one is our network of care initiative. We leverage state funding through the ACEs Aware uh, program to just set up a network of care or a multi-sector a uh, coalition of providers that have come together to try and route care around clients. The screening is basic. So if somebody has a high ACEs score, they get identified as need, as need of treatment. And the treatment is a social determinants of health. Um, so can we partner with primary care, food and economic assistance, 
um, uh, we had Unitas a referral management and our operability platform on that initiative. You might notice that we engage Aetna too. You know, they are a, both a commercial and a Medicaid managed care plan. And we asked them, can you be at the table? We, we need the perspective of a health plan to be there. Talk about population health data, talk about the needs of your network, the needs of the members that you're seeing across this, the state as we look at resolving health outcomes through this community health initiative. So um, it wasn't a requirement of that funding to engage a managed care plan, but we went out and did it, and that was a great partner in that initiative. And we're also, you know, have had some conversations with them around, can we develop a pilot program to measure an ROI? Can we look at these members that travel through this um, these services and see if there's a measurable reduction in some of the really high need areas like housing and, and expensive emergency department visits. So we've begun conversations with them around that as well. The second example, um, similarly, because we built a relationship with that night, I know they called me about a year and a half ago, I remember it was the evening and they said, hey, um, would you, Hillside be interested in participating in a, a national uh, circle of excellence. We want to partner with a researcher and, and leverage what you guys have been doing with trauma-informed care um, and see if we can use that um, to mitigate against employee burnout, turnover, and increase organizational wellness. And I said, you know, I don't even need to call our CEO. I can just tell you the answer is yes, let's do it. Um, so we partnered with them and they um, engaged this gentleman at the top. His name is uh, Chan Hellman. He's a researcher at the University of Oklahoma. We started administering this field of work he pioneered around hope-centered practices and trainings, and we're looking at measuring that across our workforce and taking those findings and seeing if we can apply it not only to other organizations that go off and market that ourselves, but from Edna's perspective on how they can productize that in their EAPs for their employer groups. So really interesting pilot program that we've done with them um, that's uh, still ongoing. I'm really interested to see where that goes. Another Example is um, the Community Impact Alliance. This is a coalition of providers in the East LA area. Hillsides took on the role as lead agency. I get the pleasure of uh, serving as the chair of the board of this group. And it's a multi-sectoral collaborative um, of providers. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis and have, have a meeting and talk about different topics, whether it be housing, food. We had a gentleman recently who talked about financial literacy and trainings available. So really the whole gamut of different social and community supports that are available for members. And um, it's interesting to come together in that way. We've also um, host events, community events. We did recently did a drive through food distribution event um, during the last holiday season, gave away toys and foods. And we kind of all come together. And you'll notice through the logos that we have health plan representation in that group as well. Um, both of our Medicaid managed care plans in LA County with LA Care, HealthNet, I've seen them in there. Blue Shield is on the board with us and I participate. So we've engaged health plans in that as well. Um, it's interesting to get their perspective, both uh, on is we're seeing this theme of health plans stepping into the community to resolve health, health outcomes. Focusing less as just being a payer and more as a partner in improving health outcomes. And we see that through initiatives like this. Uh, so it's really interesting to have them participating in this as well. And I, I, again, I'll tell you, you know, commend you guys. I love this slide. It really does show um, the importance of having strategic uh, relationships with different folks, payers and providers in the community, especially when we're working with complex populations. Um, I mean, I look here, you have LA Care, which is the largest Medi-Cal uh, managed care plan here in LA County. You've got, you've got you know, other pairs like Blue Shield and Aetna. Um, I mean, you have Ultimate, you know, for the largest FQHC primary care provider. Um, just all of these folks are folks that um, I think moving forward in this new whole person care environment that we're in, we're going to need these types of partners to manage clients and make sure they're getting all the needs that they need at a community level. So starting to have those relationships, uh, developing those now, uh, leveraging them and, and especially bringing in the payers um, to, to partner with. Um, is, is, is I, I just think it's phenomenal. And again, it speaks to what we do at Open Minds and, and, and I think that you've been successful at doing, and that is, um, you know, going to, going to payers and asking how we can solve their, their, their problems, their solutions, and not going and just trying to market what we have. It's about how can, what can we do for you? And here's what we've got and here's how we can, you know, adjust, create a continuum, do whatever. You explore alternative payment models like like value-based reimbursement case rates. Um, it really is the, the 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 way to position for all the things that are going on around us right now here in California. I I think it's 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 awesome. 
Yeah, thank you. And, and to Lucy's point, you know, when it comes time to contract, when it comes time to need a relationship and, and need someone to reach out for a letter of support, it's it's really handy to have those partners in, in hand. And we weren't in that situation a couple of years ago, and we are now. And it's it's a world of difference when you're trying to lift new initiatives and or get support for funding opportunities. So that's it from us. Um, here's my contact info. If these slides are um, shared, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to chat with anybody on this call if you have any questions or wanted to collaborate on something. And I think, we're, are we going to plug the next presentation, Richard? Is that what's happening here? I think, Stacy, I think the ball is in your court. <laughs> it is. And before before we move forward, thank you for, for everything that you've presented so far. We do actually have a question that came in from the audience that I wanted to share. Um, the question was uh, early on in your presentation. They asked, "How far out did you collect data to see if they were rehospitalized, and how did you go about collecting it? Since it's a struggle to collect long-term outcomes." Good question. That's a great question. It's it's something too that obviously the payers are reluctant to share. Um, so what we did, we took matters into our own hands. Let's follow up with them after discharge. And while we're following, um, asking them about how things are going after treatment, let's collect that data. Um, this is, you know, as we mentioned, we just launched our entire continuum um, a few months ago. We've been doing residential for a while, but we're collecting it. So it's a new process for us. Um, for now, we're doing, a, I believe, a 7, 14, and 30-day follow-up. And then we're also looking at doing one further further on down the road, like six months or a year after treatment to see if there was actually lasting change and we really had a measurable impact in terms of keeping them out of an inpatient setting for a long period of time. Um, but for now, I think it's just looking at immediately after they discharge, like, do you need to come back? Do you need support with um, part of our coordinated aftercare services? Um, but yeah, to answer that question, I don't think we were there yet where we really have any long-term data to, to pull from. Excellent. And do you have any last tips to add before we close out the session today? I would just say, you know, from just reach out and, and pitch ideas and get started. You know, I think that's the best way to do it is, is, is reach out to your health plan, see if you can get a conversation set up with them, see if you can jump on a call with them and ask them. Um, you know, call Richard, put together a pitch deck and say, here are services. <laughs> You know what's marketable can we market our existing services or can we adjust them slightly um to, to get our feet wet and start seeing what it looks like to work in this environment i think getting started there the world of opportunity is going to open as soon as you do and, and that was the case for us we just started with residential and really turned into entire continuum of care yeah and i, I would just say be persistent this nothing that we've done was an overnight process it's taken quite a long time to ramp up and um just continuing to be persistent with the payers, the referral sources, and continuing to engage with, with others in the community has been really critical in helping us to, to get where we are. And if we were to give this presentation in a few months, I wonder you know, where our data and our metrics would be as well. Well, we, we may invite you back at some point <laughs> because it is such a new program and yeah. you've seen already some really remarkable results. And our audiences always love the follow-up to see how things have evolved and, and what you've done to, to even improve upon your initial actions. And I want to thank you both for taking the time today to share your story with our audience. Um, I want to remind everyone again that the entire slide deck will be available with the recording starting tomorrow on the Open Minds website. Um, in addition, our full um, catalog of Circle Elite Executive Roundtable series is available on demand. In that same library, we have over 80 um, on-demand sessions to, to view. And I invite you all to join us next week on Thursday, March 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for our next Circle Elite Executive Roundtable, Smart Living, Innovative Approaches in IDD Support, the LAD Case Study. In that session, Brian Hart of LAD will discuss their smart technology hybrid model for delivering services to consumers with intellectual and developmental disabilities aimed at improving independence and reducing staff time and costs. And then mark your calendar for May 26th for the next in our quarterly California-focused case study series. And uh, we, again, we look forward to having you at all of our sessions and encourage you to visit openminds.com for a full lineup of all of our executive roundtables and to register for those upcoming sessions. Thank you all and have a great day.
Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye.